Good morning, and welcome back to Industrial Design. I hope you had a nice weekend. I hope you had a nice introduction week. And after our inspiring talk last week, uh, Mary Claire and I will give a bit more of an introduction into what you'd be expecting in the next few weeks uh, of the first year of your bachelor's program. So today I'll be introducing the curriculum, and Mary Claire will be giving some more detailed insights. If you have any questions, you can ask them through the chat. Mary Claire will be outside uh, of the uh, picture trying to collect some of them. And if there's an urgent question, she will pose it to me. I will repeat the question and answer it uh, throughout the live stream. So if there's anything unclear, please be free to uh, ask whatever you want through the live stream. I would like Thanks. to add, uh, when it's my part of the presentation, please don't hesitate to do the same. Um, all questions are welcome. And then I'll give the floor to Miguel. Very good. Thank you. OK, so I'll be recapping slightly what we discussed last week. Uh, as you may remember, I gave an introduction about how you can uh, discover and unlock your program here at Industrial Design. And I did this uh, by means of uh, Elsa Linda von der Dolewert, who is currently one of our master's students, and how she had the opportunity to give shape to her program. So one of the questions that we an uh, ended our presentation with was what are your dreams at ID? And I hope you took some time during the introduction week and during this weekend to think about it and to consider it. Because now we're going to go a bit more into detail on what the program exactly entails. We're going to discuss about the concepts such as identity and the development of your vision on design. But before we do that, we're going to go into the details of the curriculum and how things are organized. So the focus of our program is based on self-directed and competence-centered learning. And what that is, I'll be discussing in the next few slides. But the most important thing that you need to remember is that you are responsible for your education. It's not us as teachers telling you what to do, but you trying to understand what it requires to become the industrial designer you would like to be. So to illustrate and to discuss the concept of design, and, and obviously there's many ways to address design and what design means, but I would like to give it a bit of a context within what we mean by designing in the context of the Department of Industrial Design. And perhaps this first thing may sound a bit complex, but throughout the presentation I hope you're going to understand what I mean or what I or what we mean exactly by this. So, Designing at the Department of Industrial Design is about using knowledge skills from different disciplines in order to conceive and create innovative systems. And particularly, we do this by using emerging technologies. Although perhaps in the first few years of your bachelor, you'd be using technologies and existing technologies. This is particularly what we do in the context of research. And we use these technologies in a societal context by means of design and research processes. I'm going to take a short break to see. Is it running fine? Yeah? Yeah, we have a little problem with the TF. So okay. I'm starting to check it out. So there's a sound check. Ooh. It's good. Yep. <laughs> All right, there we go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Things happen during Corona times. We need to get used to these situations. So what we do is try to use knowledge and skills from diverse disciplines in order to conceive and create innovative systems, and these can be also products or related services, using emerging technologies in a societal context through design and research processes. So this is quite a mouthful, and I'm not expecting you to remember this, but we're going to briefly go through all these concepts at a later stage. So. Design is a relatively new discipline, and it builds upon a variety of disciplines which designers use, and they use theories and concepts from these different academic disciplines in order to design. So we take these five academic disciplines as the basis. Business and economics, the arts and humanities, the formal science, such as mathematics, uh, statistics, engineering disciplines, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, or even chemical engineering, and the social sciences, such as psychology or sociology. And designers use these academic disciplines to build a bridge to design. 
but how do these disciplines inspire design or relate to design in the context of industrial design? So let's take a first look at business and economics. So in the Department of Industrial Design, we take the perspective of an expertise area. We call it an expertise area of business and entrepreneurship. And within the expertise area of business and entrepreneurship, you learn about concepts such as marketing, stakeholder management, uh, innovation processes, or perhaps even uh, used considering a minimum viable product or how to uh, develop such a thing. You work with companies, you work with clients, and you need to manage their expectations and see how they could contribute to design. And you need to create value uh, for these customers, such as uh, this graduate who has been working with a supermarket in order to see how they could involve children in the process of designing. The other perspective is of the arts and humanities, uh, concepts such as philosophy, uh, phenomenology, but also creative processes, uh, design history, and potentially even design fiction contribute to the area of creativity and aesthetics. It's about understanding the quality of your design, uh, what materials have what effect uh, when you implement them in your project, but also, for example, looking at sound or music as an inspiration for design, or even dance. You may experience that throughout one of the first courses that you'll be taking. The third area is the formal sciences. And as I explained later, one of the first courses that you'll be taking is calculus. Uh, but not only calculus, also data analytics for engineers is one of the first year courses uh, that will be used in taking a mathematics and computer science perspective in order to inspire design. So designers make use of data, make use of data-enabled design, computer science processes, uh, quantitative research in order to inspire their processes. They have ideas such as parametric design and use data in order to generate new ideas and new uh, concepts. The fourth uh, discipline is engineering. And uh, in addition to the more science uh, departments such as mathematics and computer science, we obviously also have mechanical engineering, chemical engineering, and electrical engineering as three important departments within this university. And we use emerging technologies from these disciplines, such as robotics, smart materials, uh, electrical systems, embedded systems, to create novel concepts and to build our designs with. And this area is called technology and realization. And finally, there's the social sciences, uh, concepts such as psychology, sociology, ethnography, they're used by designers to inform their design process. They need to be able to interview users. They need to be able to observe them within their context in order to understand what it is that they're doing and how they work and how they operate to inspire their design, to be able to create the value uh, that they need for their designs. And concepts such as user experience design, the way that people experience your design, or user-centered design methods enable you to do this in the context of user and society. So, and this is perhaps a bit too small, so I hope you're going to be able to see it later on, but basically it's a short of what we've been discussing. Business and economics inform business and entrepreneurship, art and humanities, inform creativity and aesthetics, the formal sciences inform math, data and computing, the engineering disciplines inform technology and realization, and finally the social sciences inform user and society. And basically what it means is that in the context of our program, we offer courses, courses inspired by these disciplines that designers and industrial design researchers have used to translate these disciplines into a design context. So for example, during the first course, From Idea to Design, which you'll be starting next week, you use creative processes and ideas from the arts and humanities in order to conceive a design. But not only that, you're also going to get an introduction to design methodology and develop some ideas on basic creative methods in order to uh, be able to understand your first steps into the design process. The second course you'll be taking is creative programming. And creative programming is related to technology and realization. It enables you to design 
interactive systems. It enables you to program, for example, a game uh, that you can use to engage users. So in basic programming, you'll be able to control and communicate with interactive systems. The third course you were taking in this first quarter is calculus. And calculus is a generic engineering course. It's a course that is taken by all students within this university. And it's basically a formal language that enables you to communicate with engineers from different disciplines and also to understand and analyze uh, different systems and the complexity of systems. So I'll briefly go into these courses. And uh, Marie Claire will be telling you a bit more in detail about these courses uh, in her part of the presentation. But to give you a bit of a broader perspective, next quarter, you'll be learning about user-centered design, where you gain some basic knowledge and tools into methods and insights on how to involve users in the design process and how to evaluate your systems uh, when you test them with users. So as I explained, at the start of my presentation, you are responsible. And obviously, these three courses are basic courses, or four courses, are the core courses of our department. But we also give you an opportunity to choose courses and to choose electives. So sometimes you need to understand what your strengths or your weaknesses are in order to see where you would like to take some other courses. Are you, for example, interested in entrepreneurship? Then you may be able to take an elective in the area of business entrepreneurship. Or do you notice that your calculus wasn't that good and you need some more depth into this area? Then you can decide to take another course in the context of math, data, and computing. So take this responsibility and try to understand what courses are most relevant for your development. If you're strong at something, try to benefit from that but also try to look for your own witness weaknesses, particularly in the first years of the program. So to go back to the presentation that I gave last week, you can see how Linda in this case, chose the course basic form giving skills to get acquainted with better skills on designing and strengthen her perspective on aesthetics and uh, production. So choose electives you like, but also don't hesitate to choose the ones that you need because sometimes they're important for your development as a designer. And by the end of the program, we'll be assessing whether you'll be able to take all five perspectives throughout the design process. So if you leave one behind, it may affect uh, your development throughout the program. Okay, so now the scheme becomes a bit more complex. We introduce the first part. We described some courses that you may be taking throughout the program. And basically what you learn in these different courses is different ways of looking at design and different ways of looking at the design process. And not only the design process, but also the way that people do research on design through design or for design in this context. Although research will be somewhat more focused in uh, the second part of the second year, so I'll be addressing less attention to it in my current presentation. For now, we're going to focus on design processes because the first year is mainly about learning how to design and how to use insights from the different expertise areas to design. So as I explained in From Idea to Design, you learn about creative design processes. You learn how to use creative methods to support your design. Or in creative programming, you learn about engineering processes and how to use, for example, requirements to define how your system should be designed and operated. In user-centered design, you get insights from the social sciences, from psychology, from ethnography, in order to inform your design. So you learn about user-centered design processes. And all the different courses and electives you may be taking learn and uh, teach you about novel processes and other ways of dealing with design. Because all these processes is what you need in order to solve societal challenges. Challenges in the context of sustainability, healthcare and well-being, perhaps home and leisure, mobility or education. These are all important areas that the university is working on 
uh, that uh, the world is, is dealing with and, and trying to address these challenges is what we try and teach you here at Industrial Design, to use design processes in order to create innovations uh, that support dealing with uh, the societal context or societal challenges. To give you a bit of an explanation again, looking back at the presentation that I gave last week, Elsa Linda chose uh, the context of sustainability uh, and food waste and how we can deal with food, based, food waste in a more uh, sustainable way. So she used new technologies, new insights, and new methods in order to try and solve this societal challenge. So the way that we address these challenges is through squads. And although in the first year you may not encounter these squads immediately, you'll certainly be hearing about them. And in the presentation that we'll give uh, slightly later, we'll also explain where things are happening. In the department, we have a diversity of squads. And essentially, a squad is a group of researchers, coaches, but also students, second year, third year, and master's students, working on a similar topic and working on a societal challenge and try to address this from a diversity of perspectives. And just to give you an idea on some of the squads uh, that are currently in the department, there's a squad on vitality that tries to stimulate well-being by engaging people in more active behavior. Or there's the context of growing systems in the home. How do we as people deal with a multitude of systems uh, that are connected and how we control systems when there's multiple family or multiple people in one family and they all need to have access to uh, the systems such as the music playing or the uh, atmosphere control uh, or even uh, perhaps looking at uh, the sustainability of the home. If somebody is cold, uh, the other person is warm, how do you balance uh, the interaction with the thermostat and who uh, has most rights or how do you create a system that enables uh, to connect the two. Finally, there's the uh, concept of future mobility. Uh, or future mobility is another squad and uh, the future mobility, they'll be addressing how we deal with transportation and with mobility in the future, looking at different means of transportation or even at this point, how we cannot deal with transportation in a current corona crisis, but looking at how do we design uh, bike systems, how do we design uh, car systems, how do we design for the bus, or how do we design in the context of an airplane. And uh, the last one that I would like to address, and, and at the moment we have about nine squads, uh, so please engage with them and see what opportunities there are. Uh, there will be project markets during the demo days. You'll be able to see some of the other projects uh, by students within these squads and try to see which ones you would like to address. Is. And play and learn is the last one where they look at using concepts from game design, for example, to support uh, children in learning and also looking at educational perspective and using education theory to have people learn and develop themselves. And there's multiple squads, multiple ideas see what you are interested in and try to explore as many as possible. Because different societal contexts, different societal challenges require different competences, different ways of designing, different design and research process, different skills and knowledge. In play and learn, you may need to know about educational theory, which is part of user and society. Well, in healthcare and well-being, you need to know about patients and about what affects their well-being or about sensor systems that can measure their uh, heart rate variability or their uh, skin conductance. So try to learn from these squads and develop in the context of these squads. And, and just to give you a brief example of a project that a student could be doing, in this case, it was, again, the example that I gave last week. So from business and entrepreneurship, it's about creative entrepreneurship. How do you create a new business uh, from a creative concept? And working with experts in culinary arts, which is a perspective on uh, creativity and aesthetics. Trying to use concepts such as parametric design, data to inform uh, the different structures that you're creating in the 3D printing. And 3D printing then again relates to technology and realization. And finally, trying to understand how this tastes and how this uh, meal creates a certain experience for uh, the users, for the people that are experiencing it. 
And it also requires different processes. You need to talk to the chefs or even to uh, the clients of these chefs through user-centered design process. But you also need to have creative design process to, in order to come up with these ideas. And all this in order to address a societal challenge relating to sustainability in a squad, uh, potentially uh, the future of food. At the moment, we don't have that squad, but there's multiple students that are currently working in this domain. So who knows if in the next few years, we'll have one on this topic. OK, so while you're doing all these projects, and as I will tell you later, you need to try and engage in as many as possible. From idea to design, we'll offer you a certain context. And later this year, you'll be doing project one, where you'll be addressing, hopefully, another context. And then in the second year, you'll be able to choose from two squads. So see what processes, what expertise areas have your preferences, so you can develop your overall competence of design. And as I said, try to explore as many uh, squads and as many societal contexts and as many projects as possible in your bachelor. Because in your master, you'll be able to go more deeper into the areas that you're interested in and that relate best to your vision. Now it's, in, uh, now it's a moment to explore and try and understand what fits you best. So yes, the squads, the projects, the expertise areas, the courses that you take, this all helps you to develop your overall competence of design and to try and understand your professional identity and eventually your vision. And to give a brief recap on what we mean by a overall competence of design and an overall competence of design, professional identity is who you are as a designer. So it is about what competences you have. And the competence is the ability to acquire, select, and use a set of attitudes, skills, and knowledge required for effective behavior in a professional, societal, or learning context. And this is a mouthful, so I'll go a bit more into detail on what these things mean exactly within the department. So it is about your ability to acquire, select, and use attitude, skills, and knowledge from the expertise areas or the academic disciplines in the context of design. So particularly in the first year, you'll be using the insights that you gain in the different courses in your design processes. So you'll be able to address the creative methods that you learn in From Idea to Design in the first project that you'll be doing. Or you'll be able to use the user-centered design methods in project one or you'll be able to use the programming, the skills in programming that you learn for that creative programming to develop an interactive system in project one. So this is how it relates to the projects or design challenges that you'll be developing. So using the knowledge and skills that you acquire through the courses, through your learning activities, and potentially even acquire new insights in the context of your projects. So this is just to give a broad example. It's again a slide that I used last week, but now with some more detailed information on how it relates to areas. So this was a project uh, where various students contributed. Uh, I think it was about six teams working on the future kitchen. And IKEA, together with IDEO, which is one of the largest design firms in the world, selected uh, two students to go with them to London and develop this uh, kitchen of the future together with students from the University of Lund. And throughout the week, they worked in London together with designers, together with people from IKEA to build this prototype, to build this experiential prototype, which was later that year exhibited in Milan. But in order to build this uh, concept and build this idea of the kitchen of the future, the students they required competences. They had to be able to observe and analyze how people work and make use of their kitchen in the current context. They need to consider sustainability goals and the impact that some decisions have on the behavior of people. So they need to understand the underlying theories and they have, need to have underlying skills such as interviewing, ethnographic methods, uh, probes to observe how people operate in the kitchen. And all these things you learn throughout your program. 
in the context of creativity and aesthetics. She needed to be able to build a series of experiential prototypes of high quality with a sense for aesthetics, understanding what the concept, what the vision of IKEA was and translate that into their design. And they had to be able to develop a vision of the future, a fictional vision of what could potentially be possible in the context of cooking in a kitchen context. Also for math, data and computing, it required knowledge about platforms uh, that combine data from different pools of information. How can recipes and ingredients be combined? Uh, and what algorithms, for example, can we use to recognize uh, the ingredients that are placed on the table? So it's not just about recognizing a green device and saying this is broccoli, but perhaps also the shapes needs to be identified and some other elements or the weight and all these different data streams need to be used in order to create algorithms that recognize the objects that are placed on the table. Then for technology and realization, it's about creating this kitchen. It's about thinking what technologies can be implemented to realize this and perhaps it was type, so it wasn't working as perfect uh, as, or it was only recognizing the tomatoes in these case, but how will we do this in the future and how will we make sure that it works? So investigate the technologies that are currently under development, try to understand how to translate them into your design and develop a simulation to make sure that people can understand how this kitchen could work in the near future. And finally, on business and entrepreneurship, the students had to collaborate with multiple stakeholders. They had to understand the users that they were working with, but they also with the researchers and the designers at and at IDEO and also create value for a company like IKEA because it's not just about making this prototype but in the end IKEA also wants to benefit uh, from the ideas that they develop and generate uh, some income for their future. Uh, so working with multiple stakeholders and getting these insights is what you will develop in the context of business and entrepreneurship. And I think there's a question so I'm gonna ask Marie Claire to Tell me what the question is and then I'll try to answer it. Yes. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, we have some troubles with the live chat. So could you please mention that if students have questions, we are open um, to get them through email later. They can email me. Okay. Good. So there's apparently some problems with the live chat or was that you could hear what Mary Claire was saying? <laughs> I'm not sure if that was uh, the case. Right. Yep. So email your questions to Marie Claire and we'll try to answer them uh, as soon as possible. Very good. Then I'm going to continue with the slides. So we discussed the expertise areas. We discussed how the academic disciplines relate to the expertise areas, how this translates into the courses and electives that you can take at industrial design. We discussed the different societal contexts in which we operate as a department of industrial design, but also in a more broader sense where you could operate as a designer. How you learn to design by applying your knowledge and skills that you gain throughout the courses and that you develop in the context of uh, projects. There you develop your competences as a designer. And there you acquire more skills and knowledge in the context of design and research processes and in relation to the e expertise areas. And by doing different projects, and as many different projects as possible, you develop your personal preferences. You develop your personal preference regarding how to design, but also what expertise areas you feel most comfortable with or most competent within. And by developing these preferences, you develop what we call your professional identity as a designer. And this includes your overall competence of design. Who are you as a designer? What are your competences? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And how can you address challenges using these insights? And to give you a bit of an idea on how this then relates and translates to different people that are involved in the department. So we have lecturers, and lecturers are typically experts in particular domains. So taking my own example, I teach courses on creativity and aesthetics. Uh, and you'll be seeing me in the second year in a course called Aesthetics of Interaction. But there's also projects coaches, and project coaches help you understand 
how to go through a design process and how to address your design and research process in the context of a challenge. And as I mentioned during my first presentation, I'm currently very interested in food-related projects. But I'm also doing projects that are more in relation to the development of new materials. So what's important is to always talk to your coach and see what their expertise is. Because each coach has a different expertise and a different interest in design, and they work in different domains and in different contexts. And also, I need to coach my students to help them develop their identity. And obviously, it's easier when, as a coach, it relates to your own identity. So by knowing what the interest of coaches is, what their expertise is, and by trying to learn about as many coaches throughout your bachelor program, so that also requires to go through as many squads as possible, you'll find the one that suits your interest best, that matches your interest. And in the master, you'll be able to work with these coaches together in order to really strengthen and build your professional identity. So the bachelor is really about exploring and trying to get to know as many coaches and as many lecturers as possible. While in the master, you'll be able to go deeper and uh, focus on what it is that you really want to develop in the near future. But not only do we have lecturers, project coaches, and teacher coaches involved in the projects, you could also go to experts. And there's a whole university with experts from diverse domains uh, in the context of engineering, or perhaps in the context of philosophy in the departments of uh, IE and IS. So in the university, but also beyond the university, there's experts on diversity of topics. So students have been working with uh, researchers from different departments or people working in companies and that can help them to understand the expertise areas. So I gave the example last week of Elsa Linde who worked with researchers at Wageningen University to get a better understanding on food technology. Within the department, we also work with clients. And clients are typically companies that offer challenges that students can work on. So for example, we work with uh, Philips Design in the context of healthcare, or we work with uh, Daimler uh, in the context of mobility. Uh, and uh, in that way, we try to address challenges and work together with uh, these clients to understand what it is that they need and what could benefit uh, through the projects that the students do. And that way, you can also learn what type of companies you'd be interested to work in in the near future. And finally, I think what is most important is the community that we built as a department. So talk to your peers, talk to your fellow students, and try and understand what impacts you and your professional identity. Because by talking to each other and working together, you can learn about who you are and what you want. So don't forget to also discuss and reflect together with your fellow students and see what your ideas are about courses, about expertise areas, about your competence as a designer, and have others reflect and give you feedback on it. Because feedback and reflection are some of the core elements in the program. So while experts, clients, and peers can give you formative feedback, and formative is feedback that allows you to develop, that allows you to rethink what you're doing. Also, your coaches will offer you formative feedback, so formative feedback helping you to understand the context in which you're operating and designing. But sometimes we also have to give summative feedback. And summative feedback is basically an assessment. Because at some point in the program, we also need to say if you're up to the level or not. And this is basically when we take a decision if you pass or fail a course. And this is mainly, or in the end, what lecturers, project coaches, and teacher coaches do uh, throughout the program at a few instances. So at the end of the project, at the end of the course, and at the end of your first year, and also at the end of your bachelor, at the end of your master, they have to take a decision on your development. And each time you get formative feedback on your project, you have to reflect. And also when you get summative feedback, if you fail the course, well, did you fail the course? 
how can you do it better the next year and discuss it with your peers, with experts, with lecturers or teacher coaches. So we use rubrics to give you feedback on your development, uh, but sometimes you also can get more feedback by means of a discussion and listening to the coaches and, and discussing it with them throughout your coach meetings. Because if something is wrong with your professional identity, you may need to reflect whether the projects that you took are the most appropriate. Or if you're missing some insights in the context of your project, you may need to choose different courses. If it's difficult for you to deal with math, data, and computing, perhaps you need to take an additional elective in the context of math, data, and computing. Or if your vision is very strong in a particular domain and you already have a balanced portfolio, you can try and strengthen and deepen that domain. So reflection is an important part, and this will come back in the professional identity and vision learning line, which Marie-Claire will be talking about more in the next stage of the presentation. So we have different mechanisms and different methods that enable you to reflect and to design and create uh, ideas. So, as I explained, you can choose electives in order to inform your development. You're in the lead of the electives that you choose, and you basically have freedom to choose a diversity of electives. But be wise in how you choose your electives and which ones you choose. So make sure that you don't only choose the, project, the electives that you like to do, but also the ones that you need to do in order to develop a balanced competence profile. In your projects, you can set learning goals, and these learning goals are defined in your personal development plan. And during the PIMV, or the Professional Identity and Vision Learning Line, you get more insights on how to develop such a personal development plan. But the personal development plan helps you set targets for the things that you want to learn in the context of projects, the things that you want to apply. So how can you apply your knowledge from the courses in your projects, or how can you develop new knowledge and skills? And finally, through all these activities, you develop a portfolio. And this portfolio is something that you can use to show to the assessors and to the world to see, say and to determine who you are as a designer and what your strengths and weaknesses are as a designer. And reflection is therefore a very important aspect. And in previous years, I always gave an introduction on how to address reflection, but I think this is much more integrated in the context of the professional identity and vision learning line. But the most important lesson that I want to give you is, as soon as you can, get yourself a nice dummy and a pen uh, and try to make notes of what you're doing and make frequent notes. Write down everything you do, take pictures of the things you do, and collect all this information in your notebook. And at the end of each week, try to go through your notebook and see what it is that you've done that week and try to write a bit of a more uh, coherent reflection on the most important learning gains that you had. And perhaps you can use your laptop for that to get these insights and combine them with the pictures that you took. And do this very frequently. On a weekly basis, maybe advisable, and then every, let's say, uh, quarter, we want you to collect this data and discuss it with your teacher coach or with your mentor, because they will help you make sense of this data. So collect this data, hang it up in your room, and try to understand what it is that you're doing, what it is that you're learning, in order to inform your uh, future development. So get yourself a dummy and something nice to write with, Make sure that you make good pictures and try to get a frequency into reflecting into your main insights uh, every week so you can write summaries about these weekly reflections for your teacher, coach, and mentor on a uh, monthly or a quarterly basis. Because this will help you understand your vision on design. Your vision is about the type of designer you want to become and also the type of designer that society will require because we don't know what designers will, what kind of designers we will need in the future, what will be the new technologies that we'll be working with, what will be the new challenges that we're facing. In February last year when we developed the curriculum, 
Nobody knew that this year we would have to change everything because of the corona crisis. So what crisis will happen next and what will be the roles of designers in this crisis? But by understanding the ways that society changes, the new insights that you gain, you can develop a vision and try to understand what your contribution in design can be. And this basically in the end is evaluated through practice. By applying your competences, by applying your insights into designing within practice. And in the third year of your bachelor, you have the opportunity to explore this by means of an internship or by means of an exchange and going abroad. And obviously, after graduation, you'll have multiple opportunities uh, to address this. Just like Elsa Linda used her insights and her knowledge to develop her startup on sustainable food printing. So to get you inspired and to give you some ideas, you can also look at some of our graduates. And last year, uh, Julie Moons gave, interviewed 25 of our uh, graduates uh, working in different domains, working in large companies, working in research institutes, uh, or even uh, self-employed uh, entrepreneurs to understand what their vision on design is and what they did in order to develop uh, their curriculum. So you can go to the link alumni of ID and get a better insight into all these alumni and see what they're doing. So this was it briefly for me. Before I'm going to hand over to uh, Marie-Claire, I also would like to tell you a bit more on what the department is about. Because the department is not only about education, it's about research on and education in the design of systems with emerging technologies in a societal context. So that means that we're not only offering education, and obviously many of our staff members, so all the professors, they basically try to work half-time on education and half-time on research. So it's something to take into account, that teachers are not always available because they also need to work on developing new insights and generating new knowledge in the area of design. And later on in the tour that we're going to give you, we're going to also give you an idea of where the people are working. But just very briefly, the department has two research groups, Future Every Day and Systemic Change. And Future Every Day tries to bridge the gap between emerging technologies and people's everyday life through design. And they develop new insights, new methods, and new knowledge regarding designing uh, with these emerging technologies. On the other hand, the systemic change group use design and technology to study social technical systems at the level of a group or a community. So they want to see the impact that design and uh, data have on uh, improving people's well-being, for example, in the context of vitality or changing the way that people learn in the context of play and learn. So there's multiple researchers that are mainly focusing on, but also some that are doing both research and education. So always try to see what you can benefit from them because some of the research may help you as experts in particular domains. But please also take into account that it's part of their job to do research so you cannot always be uh, addressing them and you need to offer them room for that. So. That's it for me, and I would now like to hand over to Marie-Claire, who will be giving you some deeper insights into uh, the more practical aspects of the program. So Marie-Claire, here you are. All right, so welcome to my part of the presentation. Um, I would like to give you a bit more practical insights in what is waiting for you for the upcoming uh, weeks. Also, um, within about one month, there will be another presentation for you with a bit more detail about what's coming for you um, in um, the uh, second quartal and the further in the year. But for now, I would like to focus on stuff that's very important for you to know right now um, for the start of your semester. So as you know, I'm the bachelor coordinator. Um, you can find uh, my phone number. I work in Atlas um, 
if everything is uh, still going as planned uh, every Tuesday. Otherwise, you can also reach me um, on Monday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday uh, through telephone or through email, of course, uh, because I'll be available online, but not in Atlas. Um, what you can ask me about? Well, uh, first of all, any questions that you were not able to ask today um, through the live chat, because unfortunately we had some problems with that. Um, some questions regarding, for example, project one, that's uh, the first project that you will be doing, um, the first design project that you will be doing in um, the second uh, semester of your year. Um, I'm uh, responsible for all the logistics for the project, so if you have any question uh, about that, you can contact me. Uh, any procedures that you encounter during your bachelor. Uh, approval processes also. Um, professional identity and vision, I'm also connected to, so if you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and yeah, any any kind of question uh, that you don't know uh, whom to ask, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, I will try uh, to do my best to answer them. And if not, I will forward it to the colleagues uh, that can help you better with it. So a small overview of what I want to discuss with you today. Um, first of all, uh, welcome, of course. Um, what do you need to know right now? Uh, I also want to discuss very briefly the ID fact sheet that we sent you already with uh, the most important details that you need to know for the start of your bachelor year. Um, I will also introduce uh, the next uh, steps in the introduction program, which you also received already through email from us. Um, and in the end, there will be uh, a virtual department tour. So um, for those of you uh, that don't know this building yet, um, also because of this uh, COVID-19 situation, I would like to introduce our building to you. Um, we also chose this location today uh, because this is an Atlas, it's a building um, where hopefully you will be able um, uh, to work at some point during your studies. <laughs> we have to figure out due to COVID-19 when that might be possible. Um, but uh, so this is uh, one of the rooms where you might work in the future. Um, this is the building. Um, it's a very prominent glass building in the beginning of the campus. Um, so for your information, this is us. Um, there are several floors where we are situated because as you can see, Outlaws is a huge building, uh, which we share with other departments. I believe Miguel also mentioned it already that uh, we share um, this building with the department of IE and IS also some other facilities uh, um, on the higher floors of Atlas, but our department mainly is situated in the yellow part of, um, of the building. As you can see, there's this semi-yellow floor in, the, in this area. Um, so uh, if you encounter this floor, that's our department. Um, and um, we have several floors. Up until floor seven is, uh, is interesting for you. On the ninth floor, we have also some interesting labs, but um, uh, you will not be uh, expected to, uh, to really get to know those uh, as a first year student. Um, we are still working on rules regarding uh, whether you are uh, allowed and in what capacity to work as a student in a workspace just to study uh, uh, in Atlas at some point. We're not still not sure about that because of COVID-19. So um, for now, the device is the same as um, what the government says. So basically work from home unless explicitly allowed uh, um, to come to campus. So uh, any rules regarding this, you will be informed about it ASAP in case the situation changes. Um, so what do you need to know right now? This is an overview of your first year uh, of your bachelor. Um, as you can see, uh, there are several major courses, uh, a few opportunities to choose an elective, um, and also uh, several basic courses that you have to follow. These basic courses are courses that not only you will follow, but also uh, all our uh, TUE students. It's a basis for every uh, um, education that we offer in the bachelor. Um, the major courses belong to our industrial uh, design department itself. And of course, electives, you can choose a department or from a different department. Um, so that's uh, up to you. For now, I will focus on the uh, first half year, quarter one and quarter two. Why? Because that's what's coming, uh, coming uh, for you right now. And um, as I already told you before, um, within about one month, there will be another information session for you where we also 
focus a little bit more on the second half of the year, what's important for you there. Um, so I will leave that for now uh, for the next session. Um, so what is waiting for you in quartile one? Um, we have uh, from idea to design, creative programming and calculus. Uh, calculus is a, a basic course, so that is not organized uh, by us, but by, uh, let's say, TWE White. Um, and from idea to design and creative programming are core courses from our uh, program. So from idea to design, this is the lecturer, uh, Bart Hengeveld. Um, we would like to introduce you in this way uh, a little bit to our lecturers, so you also know um, who you will encounter during these lecture, uh, uh, lectures. Um, in this course, you basically go through a um, design cycle. Bart will also um, uh, really um, get you up to speed regarding this. It's a cycle that takes one quartile, so that's the difference with um, um, your uh, first project, because your first project will be a complete half year. Um, and um, as you can see, um, these uh, design cases that you will be working on um, you will be working on in groups. Uh, it focuses on 2D, 3D and 4D uh, design cases. Um, and um, here you'll basically see in practice what Miguel also discussed in his presentation, which is the design process. What does it entail? How does it go? You can get used to it a little bit. So uh, Miguel's notes regarding um, uh, basically recording everything you do will come in handy uh, already next week during From Idea to Design because this is uh, what will help you to do your um, design process as best as possible and to keep track of what you're doing, where you're going, where you want to end up. Then we have creative programming by Jin Hu, uh, whom you see here. Um, this course uh, uh, is uh, centered on computer programming um, with a uh, ID focus, um, basically. Um, so this is more uh, a programming, a programming related course because that's also important for you as a basis to be able to explore all the um, expertise areas that we have. That's basically also uh, an aim of our uh, curriculum, of course, to um, introduce you to all the uh, uh, expertise areas that we have and to also give you the skills to um, um, deal with these areas. Um, there's a, a uh, uh, for which you will need your notebook, um, which is supported by Arduino. But I would like to add for this course that, um, but I will go into that a little bit later. Um, please check carefully whether your course will be taking place on campus, because there's a very limited amount of courses that will be taking place on campus due to COVID-19 rules, um, or if your course will be taking place online, which is the majority of the courses because of COVID-19. And then there is a calculus uh, course, which I uh, already told you about. Uh, the lecturer is Hans uh, Kuipers. But as you will uh, uh, notice, this is a very big course because it's TUE wide. So um, most of the course will actually be assisted um, by uh, uh, co-lecturers or uh, student assistants slash tutors from uh, meneer um, Sorry, and calculus, of course, is focused on uh, the calculus skills that you need as a student in our university. Then professional identity and vision. Miguel also uh, touched upon this a little bit uh, during his presentation. Um, the lady that you see is uh, Isabella Bolos. She is responsible for the management of this whole um, learning line, because it's a learning line. Um, and um, Miguel already explained very well the importance of this learning line, um, but I would like to tell you a little bit about what you're going to do in the uh, upcoming half year and in the half year after that regarding professional identity and vision, because it's a learning line that takes up to um, uh, three years. Um, there's a program for first year students, second year students and third year students. Um, but for the first year students, we have um, let's say it's a more intense focus on, uh, on first year students because we want to give you the best start as possible uh, with your professional identity and your vision. Um, so let me take you through it a little bit. Um, so during your first half year, uh, professional identity and vision is focused a little more on getting to know the university and slowly uh, learning reflection skills, uh, how to make your PDP, uh, which is the uh, um, um, 
sorry, I got, I got I'm confused with the uh, uh, um, uh, with what the um, stands for. But anyway, it's a it's an important document that Miguel already uh, uh, spoke about to you uh, at length in his his presentation. Um, so during uh, the first half year, you will um, get assistance on this also during uh, PINV. Um, and what's important to note is that during this learning line, as a first year, you will be assisted by um, senior students, which are called student mentors. So during your first half year, if you have any um, questions also regarding where you can find what in the university, uh, because uh, these student mentors are also a little bit, um, can help you also a little bit uh, regarding this, but also regarding uh, your development, your professional identity, your vision, uh, regarding this learning line, uh, uh, basically, you can also ask them questions. You will be meeting your tutors um, every other week. And there's uh, exercises that you have to do uh, online through Canvas, which is our um, online uh, uh, learning platform, which you encountered through our uh, ID fact sheet already, uh, hopefully, and also last week during the TUE um, wide introduction. Um, so that is what you will be doing for personal identity and vision. And in the uh, second half year, um, you'll be handing in your per uh, personal development plan. And um, then professional identity and vision will also um, focus a little bit more on the extra support regarding reflecting um, and your professional identity and your vision. Why? Because during this half year, you'll be doing your first uh, complete um, design project. So you will have a, a half year cycle of doing this project. And then it's uh, very helpful for you at the same time during this project to develop your professional identity and your vision because it's easier for you to put it in perspective because you're um, continuously uh, also working on the same thing during your um, project. So this is a short overview of the first activities for this uh, professional identity and vision learning line. Please take them into account. You can check these through um, the code DPB381 on Canvas, this online learning uh, environment. Um, so on Wednesday, you'll get your welcome message. Please take into account that on Monday, you already have a deadline for your first um, exercise, um, which you can hand in on Canvas. Um, and on Wednesday, you'll be having your first meeting. Um, please check Canvas if this meeting will be taking place uh, online or on campus. Um, your first meeting um, will be taking uh, place on, com on campus for the most part because for us it's very important that you get to know your uh, student mentor group because you will have uh, these uh, meetings with your student mentor for this learning line in a group. Um, so then uh, you can meet your uh, fellow students of this group in person. But please don't forget uh, this timeline. Then I would like to show you the uh, week schedule for your uh, first um, quartile. Um, most lectures will be taking place online. As you can see, uh, the only lecture that might take place on campus is creative programming. But uh, what I would like to stress for you is that the main um, medium through which you can see if your course is taking place on campus or not is Canvas. Uh, this online uh, learning environment, Canvas is leading, um, so it does not matter what it says anywhere else. If Canvas says the course is online, then it's online, you do not come to campus. If Canvas says um, a part of the course or complete course will take place on campus, then you are allowed to come to campus. I cannot stress this enough, so please take this into account. Um, but for this overview, as you can see, the bulk of your uh, study load right now regarding uh, being present in, in lectures is on the Wednesday. Um, Monday morning, you'll already have creative programming. Uh, Monday afternoon, calculus. And on Thursday, from idea to design and creative programming. And the other parts of the week, of course, we do not expect you to just uh, relax and uh, sit down. These parts are to prepare for your uh, courses, your lectures that you have, um, and also, you know, getting used to uh, the university, how everything, uh, everything works here, because I can imagine a first week can be pretty overwhelming. So um, what do you need to know right now? COVID-19 guidelines. 
Um, unfortunately, we have to deal with this, uh, so I'm uh, uh, addressing this now. Um, so we stick to the general principles at TUE. We comply with governmental guidelines anytime, anytime there's a new uh, press conference, we stick to whatever is said in the press conference. Um, so keep one and a half meter distance. Online meetings are the norm. You uh, work from home, uh, that's also the norm. Um, you wash your hands often. If you feel ill or if your roommates feel ill or any parents or relatives that you live with feel ill, you stay at home and you get yourself tested. Um, also mentioned here, uh, in case you have shortness of breath or a fever, um, everybody in your household stays home. Um, as I just addressed, Canvas is the medium where you can see if a course takes place online or on campus. And also uh, you can see uh, locations. Um, if there's uh, any change in COVID-19 guidelines, we will let you know uh, as soon as possible. Um, there are uh, building-specific COVID-19 measures in place, um, which you can uh, see when you enter a building. Um, everything is outlined uh, clearly for you. And uh, in case you have ICT questions, because of course, most of the time we will be uh, uh, in touch with each other online in these COVID-19 times. Um, if you have any troubles uh, um, with online uh, related issues, there's an IMS help desk um, where you can ask all ICT related questions of whom you can see the uh, phone number right here. So, um, we have several pages where you can find uh, uh, COVID-19 rules and tips and tricks. Um, we have a, a, a page from our department itself called uh, Tips and Tricks for Online Project Work in Canvas. Um, here you can find any um, tips and tricks regarding working online uh, in COVID-19 times, regarding working uh, in a project in COVID-19 times, which we already uh, uh, developed last semester. And we will be updating this throughout the semester, uh, depending on which uh, new tips and tricks come up, uh, which new situations might come up. Um, so that is our uh, ID um, page for this. And then, of course, there's two uh, TUE pages, TUE white pages. Um, one where you can find frequently asked questions about COVID-19 and one where the um, TUE white COVID-19 measures and uh, regulations are explained. So please. Um, this presentation will also be um, um, spread online for you. I will update it on uh, our online education guide, which you also could see on our uh, ID fact sheet. Um, so if you haven't been able to uh, you know, note this down uh, uh, from our online session today, um, I will post this presentation for you to see on the online education guide. Um, so there you can also find uh, these links. Um, then what's important for you to know, we have a uh, um, center for student administration um, of which you see all my lovely colleagues here. Um, they have office hours from Monday to Friday from 12 to 2 um, in Atlas, so also in this building, and you can also reach them through email and telephone. Um, if you have any enrollment problems, please also contact them because then they can uh, fix them for you before the semester starts. So this week, I would like to ask you, please check if you uh, can enter no series, if you can enter in Canvas, if you have a, a TUE student email, um, if your enrollments are correct. So if you see the uh, schedule that I showed you before and you're like, hey, I'm missing some of the courses, please uh, also contact us because then we uh, have to see if we can fix it for you um, ASAP because we would like to start you, uh, um, you to start your year smoothly next uh, week. Um, so here you can see uh, several of my colleagues um, that you will have contact with if you email um, CSA ID. Uh, we call this office uh, abbreviated. Um, probably you will have the most contact with uh, Amy, uh, Lisa and Mabel because they are um, working with project enrollment, project allocation, uh, and also the processing of course results. Then we have study uh, advisors or uh, academic uh, advisors for the bachelor as we call them. These people are very important for you because we can imagine sometimes during your first year, um, yeah, you might encounter some difficulties going from uh, high school to university or some other uh, personal issues might come up. 
um, you never know. Uh, and then you can contact the exam academic advisor um, for any issues that affect your study progress. Uh, for example, also if you have um, a disability or dyslexia and you need some um, extra rules, uh, uh, um, sorry, you need some extra assistance for your uh, examinations, things like that. Um, and um, what I also would like to stress is please, if there's anything, uh, any personal issues that you might have which uh, uh, relate to uh, everything mentioned here, the earlier you contact the, the academic advisors, the better, because then they can still help you. If you contact the academic advisor after a deadline for a project or a course, and you say, hey, I actually had an issue, then it's much harder for them to help you because it's after the deadline. So if there's any uh, uh, personal issue that you might have, these are our um, academic advisors. Uh, and please contact them because we're here for you. Uh, so, uh, you know, use us when you need. Um, then there is a code of conduct. Uh, as Miguel already uh, explained, it's your responsibility um, to plan your program. Um, you have to uh, keep track of the dates and deadlines. You can find those in the year planning. There's a document uh, that we made for you called Dates and Deadlines. You can find both of those on the online education guide, which we already linked for you on the ID fact sheet, which we sent you through email. Don't be afraid to ask for and give feedback. Um, also, please clean up your own things at all times. Of course, uh, 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 we can imagine for you it's nice if your own study space at home is cleaned up at all times. So uh, we would advise you to do that for your own home situation too. But also, especially when you are uh, here in Atlas, when you're allowed to be here, please also clean up your own things. Um, if there's any trouble, please inform us so we can help you out. Um, and there's a code of conduct uh, which we published on our online education guide which we already um, showed you in our ID fact sheet. Um, like I mentioned before, there's an ID fact sheet that we sent you. Um, just uh, as a small recap, we mentioned there um, um, where you can see the contact person of your uh, courses or learning line or professional skills training that you do, which is in Osiris, which is our... Um, um, place where you mention uh, the outline of all the courses, basically. Um, we also mentioned that we already have an overview of electives uh, uh, that you can choose from and whether they are online or in a blended form. Uh, we mentioned there also a little explanation about the student mentor. Um, we um, mentioned um, um, how your study results are published uh, and how you can uh, see feedback. Miguel also very briefly um, discussed this during his situation. The results are published in Osiris and they are binding. The feedback you will always be able to find in Canvas in a rubric. And um, we mentioned some other important uh, details. If you have any questions about this fact sheet, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. I can uh, help you with any question uh, that you still have. Um, we also have a, a map of the TUE and a map of this building. Um, so if, if you need this when you are uh, allowed to come to campus, you can also find it here. If there's any questions, I'm so used to ask uh, if there's any questions live. Unfortunately, you can ask your questions live right now. Um, but as mentioned uh, a few times before, don't hesitate to ask them through email or to give me a call. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. And then now... Um, I would like to take you through uh, the rest of the introduction program. So in a few minutes, we will be giving you a virtual department tour. Um, there is a notebook pickup for those of you that requested a notebook. The, uh, that notebook pickup is taken care of through ASA. So you have been able to sign up for a personal time slot through ASA. Um, please go there uh, on the time slot that you requested. Um, later today, um, from 10.30 until 6. Um, there is a possibility to pick up any books you ordered and to pick up a token and to enroll at our study association Lucid. For this, you were also able to pick up time slots uh, online through the email that we sent you. Um, and the same goes for the pickup of our electronics kit at eLucid. And then um, 
on Wednesday, the 2nd of September, in the lunch break, sorry, we will have an online um, RSI uh, training session where uh, Rebecca Trka, if I um, pronounce it correctly, will uh, take you through this training uh, to make sure that you do not encounter any RSI um, complaints while studying at our department. And um, on the 9th of September, in the same uh, fashion, there is an online safety training uh, on the Burricht. We'll also make sure that you know uh, how to um, make your uh, workspace at home also uh, suitable for you so that you don't get any um, um, physical complaints from, for example, sitting on your chair that's too low compared to your desk and uh, any that, uh, of that kind of things. And then the final part of our introduction program is the Vertigo Machine Instruction by Chet Bangaru. Um, for this, you will be getting an invitation from me. I will be making uh, groups uh, among you. Um, and some of you will be uh, doing this uh, instruction on the 10th of September. Some of you will be doing this uh, um, instruction on the 17th of September. You will be uh, allocated to a time slot of 15 minutes, somewhere between 6 and uh, 8 in the evening. Why in the evening? Unfortunately, because of the availability of this building uh, and because many students are in need of having, um, having access to this building. So thank you for listening to me, for listening to Miguel. Um, and we would like to take you through our uh, uh, virtual department tour in a few minutes. Welcome to the Department of Industrial Design. <laughs> Welcome to the Atlas Building, which we share with the Department of Innovation Engineering and Innovation Sciences, the University Board and various services and the Eindhoven School of Education. My name is Miguel Berens and I'm the Program Director of Industrial Design. Today we're going to show you the Department of Industrial Design. We're located on the south side of this building and we're going to start on the seventh floor. On the ninth floor we share the labs and the research labs with the Department of INIS. But we're going to start with the research group Systemic Change on floor seven, some educational spaces, move down to the research group Future Every Day, and we're going to end on the second floor where we work together with the educational services, with Lucid and the labs that you will mostly visit during your first year. We're now at the seventh floor of the Atlas building. This is the place where the researchers of the Systemic Change Group are located. In this space, there's typically PhD students, postdocs, and teachers working that are related to the research group Systemic Change. Typically, as a student, you will not come here unless you have an appointment with one of your coaches or mentors. I am Marie-Claire Teunissen, I'm the Bachelor Coordinator of Industrial Design. Currently we are on the sixth floor um, in the spaces that are dedicated to project work for the bachelor students and also master students. On this floor the squads are situated called Studio Silver, Play and Learn, um, Transformative Inclusive Practices uh, and Vitality. Currently we are in the squad space for the squad called Future Mobility where we are working on the future of mobility and transport uh, possibilities. And this semester, students worked on the future of transport uh, with VDL for a bus. I'm Meerte Nelissen. I'm the coordinator of the master program at the Department of Industrial Design. This is one of the student spaces where master students work and attract designer leadership and entrepreneurship. This is a space for the PhD students of the Future Everyday group. We're going to go downstairs because that's where the students are working. Currently we are on the fourth floor in the squad spaces of a squad called Crafting Everyday Soft Things, of which you see all the um, exhibits here, and a squad called um, Designing for Growing Systems in the Home. 
In addition to these two squads crafting everyday soft things and designing for growing systems in a home context, the fourth floor is also the house of the second research group of the department, The Future Every Day. And this is also the place where many of the staff members and teachers and coaches from this group have their offices. We are currently in the Materiality Lab, which hosts both the Wearable Sensors Lab as well as the Interactive Materials Lab. As you can see, students can work here on different textile to production techniques and different 3D printing techniques in order to create novel structures in the context of wearables and smart materials. This is the space where most of the master graduates have their studio space. Currently we are on the third floor and we are walking towards our center um, for student administration, which is here where students can go um, if they want to know more, for example, about their project and course enrollments. Now we walk towards the office of the manager ESA and the director of education of our department. Currently we are on the third floor in the workspaces for the coordinators, which means the bachelor coordinator and the master coordinator, and also of the internship coordinator and the exchange coordinator. Next to the coordinator space, you can find the academic advisor for both the bachelor, master, but also for the pre-master students. Hi, my name is uh, Jan Rouvroy. I'm uh, head of the uh, ID Make Labs, where we and the staff help students uh, realize their prototypes. I walk here through uh, one of the spaces where students work on their projects. I'm standing now in front of the uh, e-lab. Uh, this is the place where students work on the electronics part of their prototypes and it's also used uh, for workshops where students learn to work with electronics. And you may see on the tables, these are the electronic starter kits that are distributed uh, for first years. We will now go into the search lab. In this lab uh, we give support to uh, master students and researchers both on electronics and rapid prototyping. So here we have a small exhibition of some of the great projects that students worked on uh, during their studies. Uh, for example, the projects which they did in the squad health on Hugsy, as you may see here, or if we continue somewhat further, the projects that students work on in the squad Siemens Interaction in Everyday Life, which is also located on this floor. Hi, welcome at Lucid. We're the Study Association of Industrial Design. This is our boardroom and downstairs we have our bar. Uh, we're located in Atlas and we uh, organize nice events throughout the year for students uh, based on leisure, career and education. I hope to see you soon. So I hope we gave you a small impression of the apartment and the things that you'll be doing in this uh, first semester, uh, despite the current situation. And, and thanks also to Jan, Mirte and, and Nick very much uh, for uh, their support in creating this video. Um, this is it for us for now. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and uh, we uh, wish you a lot of luck and a lot of fun uh, during uh, this first year here at Industrial Design and uh, we'll probably be seeing you and hopefully be seeing you much more often throughout the next uh, quarter and semester and year and years to come uh, in Atlas. Uh, so Marie-Claire, if you have anything to add. Um, I completely agree uh, with Miguel's uh, comments. Um, hopefully, uh, I can see you live at some point in the future. Right now, unfortunately, we don't know when that is. Um, so you'll be, uh, have to get used to me seeing me like this. Um, but for now, indeed, we wish you uh, lots of fun with the start of um, the semester, of the year, of your bachelor at industrial design. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you online uh, again soon. Good luck.